it was Benjamin Rush who brought Thomas Jefferson and John Adams back together who said, when you serve today, you connect yourselves to millions of Americans, some who have given their lives for the country, but your service today lays the foundation of a world that future generations will inherit. So that connectedness through service is so critical. Welcome to The Legacy Project. My name is Jim Koppel, president of the Servant Ford Foundation. We're an organization committed to leadership development with a specific focus on service. This podcast and its related activities are about sharing the legacy we have inherited and discussing the legacy we still want to create. Legacy is more than cars, houses, boats, and material possessions that we want to leave to the next generation. Rather, legacy is about core values and beliefs that we inherited from a previous generation. They are the values that shaped us and defined us. Legacy is also about the values we develop or create that can be passed on or shared with the next generation. We will interview people from various backgrounds and walks of life. Some are famous, some, well, maybe not so famous, and others are simply our neighbors, our friends, people who live ordinary lives doing extraordinary things. Become part of this project by being intentional about legacy. More than just memories, but principles that have guided our lives and shaped our decisions. What is the legacy you choose to create? That's what we want to discover. So today we're talking with John Bridgeland. I've known John since 1996. Uh, We worked together on the Drug-Free Communities Act and uh, did some work together in Washington, D.C. Uh, John has held a number of critical positions in Washington, not the least of which he was Chief Domestic Policy Advisor for uh, President George W. Bush. He headed up USA Freedom Corps following 9-11, which helped organize the country's volunteer movement. And uh, he's worked on legislation. He served it, uh, as a staff member, a chief of staff, in fact, for Congressman Rob Portman in Washington, D.C., uh, John, you're from what? Cincinnati, correct? Cincinnati, Ohio. Ohio. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, and uh, your your father was an attorney. Yeah, Dad was uh, essentially he grew up in the Great Depression, uh, the only son of a single mom, huh. and an alcoholic father who he never saw. And uh, because his mom was relentless about education, he got you know he he went uh, he was second in his class at Akron High School, and then had this incredible opportunity to study at Harvard Law School. And then he became a lawyer because he wanted to use it for, you know, public purposes. And uh, we grew up in Cincinnati and and dad uh, was involved in everything. You have siblings? Four older sisters that almost ruined me. (laughs) 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 Until the the good news was the oldest one was 10 years older and got a boyfriend early, got married early. And so I felt like I had a brother at the age of of 12, which probably rescued me back. Given your father's background and his history, uh, how influential was your father in your life and the choices and decisions that you made? He was the best man in my wedding, which I know is a little unusual. Yeah, yeah. And I had 16 groomsmen, Mm -hmm. so it was a big group to draw from. (laughs) So I think that speaks to how close we were. Um, He had an outsized uh, influence on my upbringing and my view of the world and view of other people and absolutely my commitment to service, public service. And he was just a great friend. We'd talk about everything, you know, from yeah. the birds he had seen in the yard that day to, you know, how you emerge from Dante's dark wood in midlife. <laughs> 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 you know, light topics like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> Very simple. Yeah. When, you, when you look back on that relationship, what were some of the key values that you've, you've taken out of that relationship that have influenced you? Yeah, uh, trust, Mm -hmm. commitment to, you know, spending time with your family. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the best ways you can love your family. Um, He had a wonderful way with children and listening to children, particularly he was president of the school board in the 1960s. And remember these kids coming through the door with, you know, long hair to talk about why the dress code shouldn't be uh, changed to force them to cut their hair or not be able to wear comfortable clothing 
uh, to talking about the Vietnam War. Uh, so listening, I think, and, and, and not being so quick to uh, assert your own view dogmatically, but to really try to listen and learn. Another thing that was funny, whenever I had success in life, he'd always say, watch the ego, son. <laughs> Like, you know, don't, there's this instinct to sort of uh, think too much about yourself. And so he was also uh, always very uh, mindful of connecting to others and really listening to people. Um, also, nature was a big deal. We, we uh, saw this uh, bird together one day when I was just 11. It seemed to be from the Jurassic period. It turned out to be a pileated woodpecker. We went out and got a bird book and then ended up getting up in in the early morning to go out on you know nature hikes and had some pretty big experiences that connected to God spirituality. Uh, also went to church and he led a Bible study discussion and drew on literature and it was really quite a, a good upbringing. So I know you, you you're a bird watcher. Uh, I don't know what the technical name is. So you, you you got that from your father? Yeah, yeah. Or we got we got it together. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah. we saw this bird, this massive woodpecker with a red head, and thought it must have been escaped from a zoo, and went out and got a bird book. Saw that it was a a pileated woodpecker, and just started to connect to seeing birds and then you know it's more about our relationship and t taking hikes and spending time together around a shared interest mm -hmm. and we had you know in canoeing and you know we went everywhere and then started the hootie owl club of north america <laughs> 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 we got the, the whole family anybody who saw an owl in the presence of a member could join mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, so Jim, we'll get you in the club next time we're That's together. Right. It's it's very prestigious. <laughs> well, it's not community organizing, but it's owl organizing. <laughs> yes, exactly. But it, you know, it also to, Dad was uh, you know he was a lawyer, he was mayor, he was president of the school board and the Cincinnati Symphony, and started helped start the Cincinnati Shakespeare. He was into everything, but. Um, he always took time for family and interests. He, you know, loved to garden, bird watch. He loved wine, learning about wine. Loved travel. Loved Europe, England in particular, London. You know, he grew up with nothing, mm -hmm. so everything was uh, interesting to him. Yeah, that's great. So, what, what kind of student were you in high school? <laughs> uh, distracted. Distracted. <laughs> I was the kind of uh, uh, student who um, I kind of couldn't sit still. I mm. always loved to be on the move, played a lot of sport, played four sports, tennis, basketball, football, and baseball, very actively through high school. Uh, always on the move. You know, Dad used to kid me. I'd, I'd always call out to my sister, Cindy, let's go hit some. <laughs> you know, let's go hit, yeah. some, hit some tennis balls. Um and but I was uh, I was a good student. I was in the kind of the accelerated math program. There were mm -hmm. four of us. Um, I always got you know good, pretty good grades. Uh, sixth grade hit, and I found myself occasionally in trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, as you're going through adolescence, nothing serious, but um, you know, just uh, I don't know, taking my stand. Um, and worked hard, you know. I uh, some subjects, particularly French, and it was terrible at languages. You know, the, the, I'd say something in, in French, and the French teacher would just give me a quizzical look, like, "What? What, what was that?" <laughs> <laughs> so it was uh, it was a mixed bag, but on the whole, uh, I like school. I like people. I liked most of my teachers, the ones that didn't terrify me. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, on the whole, pretty good. You know, I was in the same school from nursery school to 12th grade, which a lot of kids aren't. Mm -hmm. And that yeah, gave yeah. me a sense of security and stability, I think. Yeah. I always get this backwards. You went to Harvard as an undergraduate or you were in Virginia? I did. Virginia, I forget. No, you. I went to Harvard College, which for, you know, coming mm -hmm. out of uh, public high school in Cincinnati was kind of a, mm -hmm. you know, was a uh, felt like a big deal. And then I got to Harvard and 
my first uh, lunch in the lunchroom was the guy across, the student across from me was from Russia. The kid next to me from, was from Sri Lanka. The woman across from me was from Israel. And then my roommate next to me was from, from uh, Massachusetts. And I discovered pretty quickly, as great as the professors were and as interesting as the classes were, that I was learning so much more from the students there. And, you know, I met this quiet little um, Asian student who didn't say much. And then he sat down to the piano. <laughs> I felt like I was in Carnegie Hall. I just, you know, the, the sort of bursting with different, sometimes under the radar talents that would emerge. And you just, you know, you it was uh, stunning. Um, and part of me was like, for you know, Forrest Gump, what am I doing here? Mm. <laughs> sort of an early phase of imposter syndrome. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've had that many times in my life, yeah. <laughs> actually. What did you study? It's funny, I loved history and literature, and, uh, and then I had a, a uh, class with James Q. Wilson, ah. um, a seminar with John Gibbons in, a, in government, Mm -hmm. and political philosophy and it uh it changed me i i, I uh, ended up majoring in government minoring in history and literature doing my senior thesis with jim wilson uh professor wilson i always wore a coat and tie to go see him oh yeah <laughs> he was a, a brilliant guy also tough he 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 lost the last chapter of my senior thesis in oh, the my. days when you didn't have him on computers i was on a typewriter and he told me, don't worry, don't make copies. He was offended when I said, should I make copies of my chapters? He said, never. I've never lost anyone's chat. And he loses my last chapter of my thesis. Oh, my. Uh, uh, so that was a little rough. But I, I uh, you know, took courses in everything, astronomy, you know, natural mm -hmm. science from a good friend of Margaret Mead's, uh, astro uh, astronomy, uh, stars, we called it, uh, mm -hmm. was <laughs> with Eric Chasen was fascinating. They had the, one of the first live feeds from uh, circling Jupiter, you know, one of the crafts yeah, that yeah, was right. circling uh, Jupiter. So it, it was a great experience on the whole. Hmm. So did you go uh, from college to law school, right? No, I went on a rotary fellowship to oh. Brussels and then Bruges, Belgium, studied the College of mm -hmm. Europe and the University Libre de Bruxelles, um, and uh, uh, took all you know sorts of courses, but it was also about traveling, seeing the yeah. uh, the world, um, giving speeches. Actually, as a Rotarian, you were an ambassador of goodwill, mm -hmm. and I I had worked hard on my French because it's a French speaking. Um, but I was in the Flemish part of of uh, Belgium, and I stand up to give my first Rotary speech, and right before I do my Rotary. Uh, 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 advisor grabs my arm and says, for God's sakes, don't speak French. We hate the French. <laughs> you know, and so I, so I said, I turned to him, I said, well, I don't know Flemish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I luckily spoke in English and it went okay. Uh, but that was good warning. <laughs> yeah. My French wasn't very good either. So that was helpful. So over the years, you've done a lot of traveling. What is what is what have you learned from traveling? I mean, in terms of uh, the ex the experience itself. Yeah, people yeah. have you know different views of things. I'll give you an example. I lived in France for three years when I was a lawyer in Paris, and my wife and I went to a party early on, and we came home, and I looked at her. I said, Did, "Was there anything unusual about that party?" And she said, "Yeah." Not a single person asked you or me about what we did for work. Huh. And it made me realize in the U.S., you know, you're the vice president of Bank of America or you're a community organizer or you're head of this nonprofit or you're a lawyer, doctor, nurse, athlete. You know, people go right into what do you do is defining who you are. And in yeah. France, it was more about, uh, you know, your interests, art, literature, wine, you know, where you go in the South of France, um, it, much less so about uh, viewing your life through the lens of your work or profession hmm. and more about what your kind of the whole person was. Yeah. And then I've been to countries like Iceland, very xenophobic, where I felt very unwelcome. Um, 
uh, initially until like a Baldor Gudlaxon was our council in Iceland and I had to negotiate with 68 fjord leaders about the sale of a diatomite mine. Diatomite mines are made like for filtration, for making beer and other things. And um, uh, they warmed up over time and stayed in touch. But it was sometimes you hit these these barriers of culture and even xenophobia and kind of fear of foreigners. And then there are places like New Zealand where I, I went from when I was in my law practice and spent a month in the North Island and wanted to become a Kiwi. I yeah. mean, it was just like you felt like you were hugged everywhere you went. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even by the Maori, the indigenous peoples, you know, who I didn't mm-hmm. expect to, to get to know, but up in the northern part of the North Island, went up to see the Maori. It was really mm-hmm. eye-opening. Yeah. You were in corporate law for a while? Yeah. yeah. I was at the University of Virginia Law School, and in the second year, it's sort of well-known. You start really looking for a job. I'd worked for the Justice Department my first summer. And then the law firms came on canvas and this, this man, Jonathan Clark from Davis Purple and Wardwell in New York said, you know, I served on the Warren Commission investigating the assassination of President Kennedy. And, and uh, if you come to Davis Polk, you'll be in and out of public service. And so that uh, was what I was interested in. I, I go to Davis Polk and I end up doing mergers and acquisitions and initial public offers, offerings and bank regulation. And I did do some litigation uh, and pro bono work, but it was pretty far afield from what I wanted to do. Huh. And um, uh, so I, but I stayed there five years because I had the opportunity to, to practice law in Paris for three. Yeah. And then I left the law firm and, and went to Capitol Hill to be a chief of staff. And that's where I had the big, one of the biggest ex- experiences, which was meeting the seeker, <laughs> Jim Koppel. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We're talking to John Bridlin, who is the founder and CEO of Civic Enterprises, and uh, we've worked together for a number of years. Uh, what influenced you to go into public service type of law, out of the corporate law? Because uh, you obviously had opportunities, you're probably doing extremely well. Uh, what attracted you to public service? So my my dad and my mom were both into everything. You know, dad. Uh, I told you about dad. And mom, though, was a, a force. You know, she had five kids, up at five. House was always perfectly clean. Breakfasts were always, you know, felt like a short order chef, you know, in a cafe. Yeah. <laughs> but really good, much better. Um, but she was into everything, you know, the PTA, Parent Teachers Association. She volunteered in school. She was at the Institute for Learning and Retirement. She, uh, she just loved people everywhere she went. I mean, going to the grocery store or the right, you know, the, the, the local uh, pharmacy or uh, other commercial enterprises weren't commerce to her. They were community. Mm-hmm. She knew, you know, you'd go into the Kroger's with mom and, oh, there was Bill in the meat section and Robert in the vegetable section and everybody was, I don't know, she loved the world. Um, mm-hmm. And so uh, public service was sort of in the DNA of our family. And then surrounding it, you know, it's hard today because we don't have these kinds of examples. But President Kennedy was so inspiring as a leader. And I used to listen on the record player to his inaugural address, which I still to this day have memorized. Yeah. And then Robert Kennedy, you know, and the way they drew on literature and history and philosophy and Aeschylus and <laughs> Shakespeare, but, but integrated in a very inspiring way, you know, big public purpose. And then Martin Luther King. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, it was just an environment, of course, unfortunately, littered with tragedy. Yeah. But it was a big, you know, it, it was the ask not era. Right. Yeah. Right. And you felt right. like, and then the other experience I'll tell you, Jim, was I uh, my next door neighbor when I was older. I mean, I'm still in, in late teenage years in college was Neil Armstrong. Oh, really? <laughs> he came over for dinner. He was he was a friend of my dad's. They were in a uh-huh. uh, association in Cincinnati together where they roomed together because they did it alphabetically: Armstrong, Bridgeland. Yeah. And Neil loved Dad because Dad never asked him about the moon. You know, he just treated him as an ordinary guy. But Neil came over for dinner one night 
and he was a very reclusive guy. He'd spend time, you know, in his basement on his ham radio or out at Lunkin Airport in his glider. He liked to be alone. wasn't wasn't the right guy for the NASA public service mission, you know, public affairs yeah. mission, which Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon, took over. But he was exactly the right person to be the pilot, you know, who took over the manual operation and landed that spacecraft, Apollo 11, safely on the moon. But he said something once that sort of changed my life. He said, you know, when President Kennedy challenged the country to go to the moon and within a decade and return a man safely, uh, technologically, we actually had no idea how to do that. Mm-hmm. And yet it inspired 400,000 engineers to pull it off. And then he just uh-huh. stopped and he said, I don't understand we don't, why we don't do more of that. Man. And that was it. And I was sitting there, I was looking at the beneficiary of the 400,000 engineers. Right. Right. <laughs> and it actually has informed my view uh, of leadership mm-hmm. and uh, this idea that we can't just look to politicians to define and solve problems. We should be creating platforms that unleash the ingenuity, creativity, entrepreneurial spirit of the American people and her institutions Mm -hmm. to hack and solve problems. Much like, you know, you're leading and I'm helping on Act Now, much like this COVID collaborative, much like our work on the high school dropout problem or malaria or frankly the community anti-drug coalition movement that you really got going, you know, in Kansas Mm -hmm. City and then at the helm of of community anti-drug coalitions of America. And then that bill that we worked on, the Drug Free Communities Act, you know, it was uh, those are good examples of like unleashing energy in the country. Yeah. Neil was right. Why don't why don't we do more the more of that? Yeah, that's a powerful statement, and that's a, an, a, an amazing observation. Well, Brett, you have uh, also uh, coming out of uh, uh, well, first of all, the transition uh, from uh, chief of staff. That that's pretty grinding work. Was it, did you see yourself in that role as as uh, being able to exercise a lot of this vision and this passion that you have for service? Yeah, you know, grinding work was the law firm being up till two yeah, or three uh, in the morning. My wife sometimes, yeah. sometimes thought I was dead because <laughs> I, I would I'd be gone for you know forty one days on a deal where I'd be coming home in a black car at three o'clock in the morning back in the office at seven. Wow. And traveling, you know, to countries and, and places where you just have to grind it out. Mm. And it didn't always feel like big public purpose. Yeah. You know, being a chief of staff in some senses was a relief. I mean, I was in to, to had the ability to connect to people back home in Cincinnati. Yeah. We wrote nine bills on a bipartisan basis that were signed into law. One of them with mm. you, the mm. Drug Free Communities Act. Uh, but other interesting bills like the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, the Tropical Forest Conservation Act, mm. um, uh, the National Underground Network to Freedom Act. Huh. Uh, yeah, it uh, um, with Louis Stokes, an African-American uh, congressman from Cleveland who was head of the Congressional mm. Black Caucus, very well respected um, and a force uh, an, in public service. And in those days, you, you had big men and women in public service who were in leadership that in times of crisis or trial for the country, they actually transcended politics to yeah. come to get together to do big things for the country. And I remember listening to the speeches of the Speaker of the House or the Majority Leader, or Minority Leaders, and hearing how they captured both public sentiment and public wisdom um, in a way that transcended politics and got things done and we just don't unfortunately we don't see that yeah yeah it reminds me uh, of a statement during the french revolution a french royalist by the name of mirabeau said that we live in an age of big events but an age of little men yes that's what i'm feeling in these <laughs> these days you know the events tend to overtake us and so then you went into private you started your own business um and uh, started working on a number of issues. We worked together there with the National Crime Prevention Council as well. Yeah. You move into the uh, Bush White House. Uh, you were involved in the... Uh, Florida recount? 
Yeah, the voter recount. I was deputy director of the of policy on the campaign under Josh mm-hmm. Bolton, who was my mm-hmm. boss and um, one of the best bosses I ever had. And uh, we were developing all sorts of policy, the whole compassionate conservative yeah. agenda, the faith based initiative, mm-hmm. um, all sorts of policy. Remarkably, we outflanked Al Gore on climate change. <laughs> by, That's amazing. Which is yeah. an amazing thing. Although when we got in the White House, uh, that didn't stand mm-hmm. because uh, Vice President Cheney was running an energy task force and we sort of got sideways into that, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, it was so I, after the, uh, I was on election day, our policy staff was bowling in an Austin bowling alley with Bo mm. Derrick, who was the <laughs> only Hollywood star who was behind Bush or one of the Bush. few. And I, I remember teaching Bo Derrick how to bowl. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> that's amazing. And she was very kind, very nice, you know, good person. And But we all had a ball. And so that day, there was nothing left to do but wait for the election results. I'll never forget being in Carl Rove's office when CBS, I think it was Dan Rather, called Florida for Gore. Mm-hmm. And Carl had like three re- computers around him. And he's banging away and he goes... Bush is up by 352 votes in Florida. That's wrong. Mm. And sure enough, so on, on election night, I go up to the, the Capitol, state Capitol, to hear what I thought would be either pres- uh, candidate Bush give a concession speech or an acceptance speech. And our campaign chairman, Don Evans, comes out with his big Texas belt and says "There's the, 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 the election hasn't been decided. There's going to be a recount. And so the next day I'm on a plane with Jim Baker flying to Florida uh, to help uh, oversee a legal team with Ben Ginsburg um, on what's called the Florida recount. And those were among the most miserable 39 or whatever number of days it was. Uh, I I try to push it out of my memory, Uh, (laughs) you know, just the waves of back and forth going all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, in a seven to two decision. But the one thing though, when I'm in Jim Baker's office, and uh, you're not going to believe this, but Ted Cruz was on our team. Brilliant oh, wow. legal guy. Yeah. I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we get word from the Supreme Court, and I go in and I tell Secretary Baker that. Uh, it's president elect Bush. And so he, I'm in his office when he gets candidate Bush on the, on the line. He says, well, congratulations, Mr. President elect. Wow. So after the campaign, then I, I, I was tapped to be director of the white house domestic policy council. And then after nine 11 oversaw that, you know, created this big new national service initiative that oversaw the peace Corps, AmeriCorps, Vista conservation Corps, youth build. Uh, and also oversaw the faith-based and community initiative that was being run by John Duolio, uh, who kind of invented it, frankly. Yeah. And was an amazing, yeah. amazing human being. So in terms of the volunteerism, and also, as you said, the, what was it, 39 days of uh, waiting in the yeah for the outcome? How did you sustain yourself? I mean, mentally, spiritually, emotionally? That, that again, sort of the grind of that kind of intense work that was so po- political, so visible in the community and the country. How do you sustain yourself? One immediate uh, way is laughter. Mm-hmm. We had a okay. lot of laughter in all these environments. Josh Bolton had an incredible sense of humor. I'll give you an example. We were in the Oval Office, and I was briefing the president on an environmental issue, and I. And, and the president said, what, what's the name of that organization, the, the nature uh, uh, concert, you know, the, the, the nature conservation international or so he sort of mixed the and uh, and I said the nature conservancy and but and then Josh Bolton quipped, but we'll get them to change their name, Mr. <laughs> president. <laughs> So I, you know, a sense of humor goes a long way toward re- uh-huh. reducing stress. Uh, also, not taking yourself too seriously. When I had to 
mm-hmm. first time I'd go in front of the White House press corps, talk about the faith-based initiative, and you know that White House seal that was behind me, and uh, I sort of under my breath go, "God, I feel like such an imposter." <laughs> you know, <laughs> who is this? <laughs> Uh, but the other, you know, obviously your family, st- you know, in, in regular mm-hmm. touch with the family and and integrating the family into like lunch in the White House, have them experience the benefits. My daughter, my daughters were into Irish dancing. They ended mm-hmm. up, their, their school danced for the president in the White oh, House. Wow. You know, those little yeah. things that, and then the Christmas parties and the, you know, the intimate White House dinners with the senior staff. And, and uh, I also served in the Obama administration. And, you know, s- same thing where you you try to integrate your family into those special moments. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to that point, in terms of uh, you, you have two daughters, right? And a son? Two daughters and a son. That's and a good memory. Son. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in terms of the legacy you've inherited, what is the legacy you want to leave to them? What do you what do you what do you find important in the way you interact with your children and the kind of values that you hope they inherit? You know, a verve and love of life. I mean, mm-hmm. really connecting to daily experiences and to one another and to friends and laughing, you know, finding joy and happiness. It's interesting, we just did a survey of parents during this difficult COVID pandemic and looking at, you know, what they want for their kids in ter- education and sort of the, and uh, more than like being well prepared and getting into college or even getting a good job, they just want their kids to be happy, you know, and find fulfillment. Part of that is, you know, I always say connecting to the central nervous system of the universe, God, uh, uh, spirituality, recognizing that you know, I, I, that line from the Gospel of Thomas, the kingdom of heaven is spread before the earth and men do not see it. That, yeah. yes, it's, it's there beyond and things we do not know, but it's also here and we can have a big experience. The other thing I, I try to, I've tried to do, we go to a lot of national parks. Mm-hmm. Took my daughter, my whole family, and my daughter Kaylee was 16. She had a boyfriend back home. She was not excited to go to, to the uh, uh, Grand Canyon away from her boyfriend, <laughs> and uh, which is normal for a sixteen-year-old. And we're plus she didn't like getting up early in the morning, so we're seven o'clock in the morning. You know, I had him up, and we were out on the Kebab Trail in the Grand Canyon, and the light from the sun was coming, reflect, you know, coming in through the canyon and casting all sorts of shadows. And we saw this beautiful western tanager, which is yellow and, and has some wonderful colors to it. And Kaylee, who's hiking just slightly ahead of me, turns around and says, Dad, I just want you to know, this is the greatest experience of my life. <laughs> and I went, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it right. reminded me when my dad and I were, when I was 12, he was in his 50s, and um, he, we went into a wood. Redbird Hollow uh, in Cincinnati and uh, we had this big experience where we both stopped each other and just stood there for five minutes and this big tree slammed, fell down across the path and bounced, you know, a bit and uh, we looked at each other we had this, I don't know, we had this big experience of like connecting to something beyond the normal human experience and I after dad's death I, I, he gave me all his journals and I looked at his journal that day and you know what he wrote? From William Wordsworth, one impulse from a vernal wood may teach us more of man, of moral evil and of good than all the sages can. Wow. And it reminded me of why, you know, this power of nature being out at Robert Kennedy Jr., I heard him talk. He's a you know, river keeper, environmentalist. This is uh, Bobby Kennedy's son. Um, talks about these cathedrals that are national parks. You know, and uh, yeah. John Muir actually went crazy as deputy director of the National Park Service behind a desk. But when he was out you know, in those parks growing that long Scottish beard, he was, he was connected. So I try to connect kids to things outside the technology and the, 
you know, ordinary course of things. Uh, oh, that's great. So let me ask you this, Bridge, and we're coming to an end here, and I appreciate the time you've taken. This has been really ex powerful. Um, most of us have symbols in our lives or things, artifacts that we have kept uh, that kind of remind us of where we came from, who we are, what we do. Um, I, have a, I have a black box that my father gave me. He was in the Second World War and was wounded twice. And uh, it's a medical kit that they gave him as he was being transported back to the U.S. And he gave me that. And I carry, I put special stuff in there, I mean, that over the course of my life. Um, do you have any of those kinds of artifacts or symbols that you value that you just keep in front of you? Yeah. Or, or I don't know if you ever saw the movie uh, Leap Year. Uh, which is a romantic comedy that takes place in Ireland. And uh, the suitor asks the uh, the ingenue in the movie, if your house were to catch on fire, beside your family, beside your pets, what's the one thing you would grab uh, or you would seize uh, that kind of defines your... My kids. <laughs> well, well you rule out your kids, your family kids. What, it's something tangible. Yeah, yeah. That does, doesn't breathe. <laughs> well, that's so interesting. I do have this stuffed animal uh -huh. uh, called Racky that I had since I was a little boy. And, you know, it was like comfort. Yeah. And uh, what's interesting about it is it was just a couple of years ago. I, I show Racky to my, my 20 year old son, Regis, who's now 22. And he, he goes, Dad, why, why are you calling that? Why do you call that Racky? I said, We well, you know Racky the raccoon. He goes, Dad, that stuffed animal's a fox, <laughs> not, not a rac. And I looked at it, and I said, Oh my God, that is a fox. <laughs> so I was just kind of a dumb kid. <laughs> Here's the another thing. Uh, it's an arrowhead. Uh -huh. I have a collection of arrowheads. I. Um, I love family history. I love connecting back to family history. And uh, we're direct descendants on both sides of the family um, to six passengers on the Mayflower. Wow. Uh, some people think, oh, that's elite. It, these were religion people who were persecuted for their religion. They were poor. They came to the New World. Most of them died, you know, of, of uh, disease. Um, but the other powerful thing on my dad's side is we're connected to uh, Massasoit, Richard Starkweather, Luna Way, um, Peabody, the 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 the, uh, the girl who married King Philip uh, is a direct descendant, and and it was Massasoit and the Pilgrims who whose relationship and the first Thanksgiving sort of set a wonderful standard of how people from very different cultures and ways of life could actually interact peacefully. Yeah, it was King Philip. Of course, King Philip's War that became a very different story and the horrific slaughter of indigenous peoples, and you know it's one of the right. great stains on American history. But um, so I, I have little things that just remind me of uh, family, and I also have a, you know a, a owls. Great horned mm -hmm. owl is my spirit animal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've, I've done a uh, sweat lodge. Have you ever done a sweat lodge? I have done a sweat lodge. Yeah, I did yeah. a sweat lodge and uh, had some experiences, which was interesting. But anyway, I, I have a lot of owls, birds around. And then I have things, Martin Luther King, uh, you know, even though I'm a Republican, I like, I'm sort of nonpartisan, frankly, uh, and served, you know, Democrats and admire, admired Democrats. Um, uh, you know, things that remind me of bridge building. Yeah. That's cool. That was a long answer to a very simple question. No, no, it's a great answer. <laughs> I tell you, Bridge, I didn't realize we one thing we have in common. When I, I mean, I was heavily influenced by John Kennedy. I was fourteen years old when he was assassinated, and I grew up in the Midwest. And you know, the Nixon Kennedy election, my parents were torn. Though my grandmother was past president of the International Garment Workers Union, and um, I met Kennedy. Oh, wow. I was 11 years old in a holding room in Truman Corners and when he was campaigning for president. Yeah. And uh, my grandmother got me in the room and that forever changed my course. Uh, but when I was in college, I had memorized, after Kennedy's assassination, I memorized just about every major speech Kennedy gave. Same. And my first year in college, I here's a guy from the Midwest going to school in Boston going to high schools giving Kennedy speeches. <laughs>
I think a lot of us did that. We go to the moon the in moon. this decade and do the other things. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it was such a defining experience. Yeah. Well, Brits, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. This has been great. Um, I appreciate your your work and what you've done for this country and your service, the spirit of service that you bring to it, the legacy you've inherited and the legacy that you're still creating in the initiatives that you uh, are about. We work together in the Act Now initiative and uh, we... I think this is going to have an, a, a major impact in the way we do policing in this country. And um, it's your vision and your imagination that has uh, taken us uh, to these places. So thank you for your time. My pleasure, Jim. I just have to say what you just said in terms of how you frame service. It was Benjamin Rush who brought Thomas Jefferson and John Adams back together who said, when you serve today, you connect yourselves to millions of Americans, some who have given their lives for the country. But your service today lays the foundation of a world that future generations will inherit. So that connectedness through service is so critical. And you're one of my favorite people in life. I love you. I love The Seeker. Everybody should read The Seeker. And uh, we should (laughs) all be more like you in in creating wonderful legacies for children, family, and the country. Well, thank you, Bridge. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you later. To find out more information about this conversation and other Legacy Podcast episodes, go to ServantForge.org. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and consider leaving us a review. We want to hear from you. We want to get your ideas and your opinions. I have a new book that corresponds with a Legacy Project titled The Seeker, Bring Me the Horizon. You can find a copy of it on Amazon or your preferred book distributor. The book corresponds closely with these podcasts. The podcast episode was produced by Matt Erickson and edited by Carissa Erickson. The music is by David Hyde. Please look for a new episode of our podcast coming out soon. Remember, you have inherited a great legacy. You have an opportunity to create a great legacy. Engage your past to build a future.